get started and introduce Norm in abstention and Kurt. And, uh, and since he's not here, I can say a couple things to embarrass him. But, uh, I met Norm a few years ago, uh, and we've been building a friendship uh, on, a, uh, on a regular basis. And I learned a little bit about this guy. Uh, he's had an incredible life. And he is as dedicated an artist as I know. He is uh, as passionate about his vision, um, his creative vision. Uh, and so he, uh, he was born on September 17th, 1943. 44. And I know him personally. 44 <laughs> in Lebanon, Pennsylvania. So, uh, Norm, a belated happy birthday. Uh, got your card. All right, here we go. All right, welcome aboard. Uh, huh? Here we go. Yeah, we're, we're rolling. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, uh, I'm only going to share with you a little bit of his life that he's already put on the internet. Norm is from a broken home. Uh, he grew up in small towns on the streets, largely unsupervised up and down the East Coast. He no. went to reform school, and that's his education. He had the good fortune of uh, having a wonderful foster family that after he uh, finished reform school, sent him back to high school for a year. So he graduated with a high school, from a high school class, and I don't remember what school he went to, but you can fill in the blanks. Norm's uh, primary source of education and this is why this is such a great meeting for this in the public library. Uh, most of the material that he got uh, for this, this, this novel, uh, which has just been published, has come from spending time in the reading rooms in the stacks of the public library. In his case, a lot of those are the reading rooms. So uh, no, he's learned, he's learned from great authors, and great books from reading he's not learned from instructors and formal education. But he's learned, he's learned a lot. And his, uh, he, uh, his artistic career uh, uh, has been a, as a singer, a songwriter, a musician. Um, he's uh, fronted two bands. And for uh, some of you who've been in the valley for a while, you might remember Clean Living. They had, they had, uh, they had a hit. But the hit that they had was not emblematic of the music that they played. The music that they played was fabulous. The hit was a novelty song. All right. So then he also uh, put together a band uh, called uh, Youth Well Spent. And again, Norm's, uh, as an artist, uh, one of the albums that he, he had, he, he, uh, he, he put together, released with this band, his, uh, his goal was to actually show that he could do every uh, art form, every genre, a show associated with the folk tradition. So the ballad is the ballad of Mary Reed. And he learned about Mary Reed through his research uh, at the public libraries. So he wrote this song, and um, we're going to play it in a second. And it's six minutes and 40 seconds long. And when the song is over, the floor is yours. And you'll hear him, you'll hear his music, and you'll hear the story that this is based on. So you'll be up to speed. Um, the uh, only other thing I was going to say is, oh yes, so he's written this book, and I have another friend in California, and together we put together a production company. So the friend in California uh, is a, a location manager, and he spent his entire life doing location work. All his credits are below the line. And he's always died to have some creative credit somewhere. So he's taken Norm's novel and he's given it to a, uh, an actress and a scriptwriter, a screenwriter. And you might have heard of her. Uh, her name is Laura Harrington. Uh, she was in uh, what, she was an actress in What's the Matter with Wilbur Craig. Uh, she's been in a number of movies. I can't give you her resume. I don't know my head, but but she's she's our in. And uh, so she 
loves Norm's book. And she is currently writing a script for us. And we should have it sometime in, in October. It's going to be a pilot and an outline. And she's got a manager. She's got an agent. And she's going to want to sell this. So we're pretty excited. So let me play. Oh, and when Norm is done, we do the question and answer. Uh, we have a two-minute teaser that we made, which is a device used to attract creative talent in out west. There <laughs> All right? And around here, too. So maybe somebody who's going to be here tonight that can help us out. the high piracy with shiny brass buttons and a broad sash of scarlet as likely a rogue as you'd see with hair the color of new crystal sails and eyes deep and green as the sea no livelier mate ever sailed the account than the long and the fair Mary Reed. All along in the fair Mary In the carpenter's birth of a brig named the Rachel We stood out from Bristol City Our cargo was bound for the Isle of Jamaica Returning with rum we would be There south of the Turks a dark schooner drew near With a black flag that filled us with fear Hard pirate crew, I first met the fair Mary Reed. Oh, I first met the fair Mary Reed. There, boarded and plundered by Captain Jack Rackham, I was forced to his crew for my skill. I run foul of a bully named Black Mike McGowan Who figured me better off kill When a tall blonde haired sailor stepped up in between Crying Mike first just settle with me They're true to their code of cutlass and ball He fell to the bold Mary Reed Oh, he fell to the bold As a man, only Rackham the wiser, a skilled topsail hand for his crew. And I, all unknowing, admired and befriended the bold, handsome rascal I knew. One day in the orlop with a voice soft and low, John, I think I've got something for thee. I first gazed upon the white breasts of fair Mary Reed. Oh, the white breasts of fair Mary Reed. From that moment we treasured our watches together as star-crossed lovers we two. She told me her story, a life of adventure Her prowess with weapons proved true She'd marched across Flanders with Marlborough's host And rode in the King's cavalry She lived 
as a man, loved as a maid, the bold and the free Mary Reed. Oh, the bold and the free Mary Reed. We had barely three months till John Barnett came on us with warrants to fetch such as we. Encumbered with chains back to Port Royal, Jamaica, to answer for high piracy. There I, as a forced man, was set free to go, along with the boys of the band. But they're forced to witness an admiralty court, condemn the fair Mary Reed. Oh, condemn the fair Mary Reed. Mockingly said it was good you hang pirates Or cowards would clutter the sea Then she turned to the courtroom and opened her waistcoat The swelling there clearly to see No admiralty court would condemn the unborn Though the crimes of the mother be great So it was there that the fruit of our love brought reprieve for the fair Mary Reed. Oh, reprieve for the fair Mary Reed. But the Spanish Jack burned through the Spanish town prison with warrants no court could aside. And when word was brought to me that Mary had perished, I boarded and shipped with the tide. Now I practice my skills in these New England hills And I stay well away from the sea For the rush of the wave and the cry of the gull Bring me grief for the lost Mary Reed Oh, I grieve for the fair Mary Reed My name is John Tanner, I once loved a rover who practiced the high piracy. If you have an interest, you can go on YouTube and you can look up and download both of the albums. There's one that's called uh, Just Youth Well Spent. That was the first one. Uh, that's a really very folk oriented. Uh, the second one is called Two Different Worlds. That was has more songs on it than I have tried to write a hit from time to time. <laughs> and uh, those who read the book understand the significance of this. I'd like to add to the bio that, that uh, Will gave me. Uh, yeah. Unsupervised. The only supervision was to remember to not irritate the old man when, I, when he got home. <laughs> Real cool. My work life began at eight years old. I was collecting bottles for deposit, and I was shining shoes in two barber shops in Sebring, Florida. I make a note here. This was demanding work in those days because everybody wore black shoes and white socks. <laughs> so it was very demanding work. Uh, I've lived on the rough edge most of my life. My lessons have been learned the hard way. My education has been gained the hard way. I discovered historical novels at nine years old. I ran into a copy of The Iron Mistress by Paul I. Wellman, and I read it. I don't know any nine-year-olds these days. I've got an 11-year-old grandson, and they still won't let him read adult novels. Uh, in there, I really learned, my father, for all his faults, he had taught me to, to read early on using comic books, frankly. When I got to first grade, Dick and Jane were really a yawn, frankly. Uh, but anyway, uh, in that particular novel, I really understood what happens when the mind reads something and paints a picture. And I realized that people need to paint their own picture as they, as they read. Uh, my companions and teachers through the years I want to name them because they're the ones who taught me to do what I do. Uh, Kenneth Roberts, the Dean of Historical Writers, uh, 
any novel of his is worth reading. Uh, not that the others are. C.S. Forster, Paul I. Wellman, Frederick Marriott, uh, Mr. Midshipman Easy, he was a retired post captain in the British Navy back in the day and wrote novels based upon his experience serving in Majesty, His Majesty's Navy in the 18th, 19th century. <coughs> James A. Missioner, of course. Louis L'Amour, I've got at least one tribute to Louis L'Amour in the book. Uh, Richard H. Dana, two years before the mass, if you want to know what it was like working on a merchant ship in 1836, there it is, day to day. Uh, James Clavell, of course, uh, and Patrick O'Brien. Those gentlemen, uh, as I say here, I've endeavored to write a historical novel of sufficient quality so that when, my, when I get to the Elysian fields, I can greet them with my head held up. Uh, I want to acknowledge Donald Dorothy and Esther Morrissey, who rescued me from the bulrushes. Uh, Shirley Industrial School is like the Choke Academy of the uh, Massachusetts Correctional Institutions back in the 60s. And for Will Sillon and Jeff Crandall, who kicked uh, new life into an old man. I started this novel many years ago, and then the Parrots of the Caribbean came out. I threw my hands up. <laughs> Nothing I could do beyond that point that it wasn't going to be derivative. Uh, and it was when Will read what I had of the novel and uh, brutalized me into finishing it. <laughs> We're going to meet John Tanner. Uh, he's living a little south of Brattleboro, what's now Brattleboro, Vermont, on a hillside that uh, recently, you know, within the last hundred years, disappeared uh, because of Sasasimo lumber. But there he is, uh, and it's his voice that you're going to hear. A young man came north along the river to visit me three days ago. He came well mounted, leading a pack horse. He was dressed much in the Abenaki fashion and wore leggings and a hunting shirt made of smoked deer skin as soft as velvet and a wide flat brimmed hat. Can you hear me well? <laughs> he came up from his family's home in Gloucester leaving early and heading west. I'm headed out to the Mohawk Valley, he told me, or maybe further on to the Ohio country. He brought me greetings and presents from an old shipmate. Now I recognized his father in him right off, although he was built upon a larger frame and was more robust in appearance. His father, Merritt, was retired from the sea now, and his two elder brothers, Andrew and Philip, took over the family business trading along the coast from Gloucester, south to New York, and north to Arundel. Arundel's my tribute to Kenneth Roberts. If you haven't read Arundel, you really need to. Uh, they sailed two fine vessels, a fast Jamaica-built sloop called the Spaniard, and an Ipswich schooner named the Lily, which, by the way, is the name of the fellow who wrote the letter that's coming up. That's his wife's name. This son, Nathaniel, the youngest, felt no call to the sea, however, but was drawn to the deep forests and to the great solitude. He was a keen-eyed lad, alert and sanguine, and he seemed to know his way about the business he was going on. That first night after we'd eaten and talked a bit, he brought out a small cedar chest from the duffel that he'd unloaded from the pack horse. My father sent this to you, he said. He told me to tell you that the contents might affect you some, and for me to warn you thus. There's a letter from him inside who will explain everything. <clears throat> Excuse me. Filled with curiosity, I knelt before the little chest and unbuckled its straps. The chest was well fitted, lined with tin. It held six wrapped dozens of fragrant Cuban cigarros, a blank ship's log, two fine quill pens, a bottle of India ink, and a Spanish dagger. The scent of the cigars washed up and brought me a wave of memories. But at the sight of the dagger, however, it was as if a ghostly hand had taken it up and cut me to the heart. So powerful were these emotions that seized me. I must have been visibly shaken, for the boy quietly arose and left me alone in the cabin. I composed myself some and removed the letter which was rolled around the hill 
and tied in place with a long blue ribbon. There was no mistake about the dagger. Eight inches of blue-brown Spanish spada, two inches wide, two inches of its length being a thick toil bound with German silver wire. Its hilt was the tip of a narwhal tusk, worked so as to have a slight bulge up close to the toil. It was a design that was old when Rome was a village. I was still shaking inside as I began to read. Dear mate, he started. I sent down to the island special to get these cigarros for you. The younger Senor Vasquez says they are the best Cubanos he knows of. His father, that being the Jorge as we know, had a scrap with a surly sort of fellow, fellow hailed from Manteca. Fellow was used to serve John Barnett. Anyway, Vasquez says the fellow made the mistake of pulling this blade on the old man and that the fellow will have no further use for it where he is now. <laughs> Young Vasquez sent it north with the cigars. He said the old man wanted it passed on to the proper owner, which I have now done. I sent the pens and such along to ye in the hope that you'll start to write your story down. It's been a long time now, mate, and I think the living are down to thee and me, and the viejo uh, Vasquez, of course, but his family's straight traitors now, and you don't give a damn what you write. I always thought it a story as wants to tell him. Since Roberts went under, all the great pirates are gone. Just a batch of penny thieves and cutthroats now. When we sailed, there were still some as could make the world take notice. The real point of this letter, however, John, is that the family has talked on it and we want you like you to come down to Gloucester. We'd like you to take charge of our boatyard. We want you to do some building of our own vessels. There's a smell of another war coming from the old country and my oldest boy, Andrew, wants to build a big, fast topsail schooner for privateering. The whole family is in complete agreement on this. You'll have your own place and be well taken care of. You'll have plenty of time as well to write the story. The door and our hearts be open to you, John, and all hope to see you come. The note was unsigned except for a little stick drawing of a hanged man. I sat for a time after I'd finished reading, and then I went out and joined the boy on the porch. We sat together there each night of his visit, smoking the cigarros and watching the long, drowsy twilight settle on the river. The music of the waters and the forest filled the dusk as the fall of night came on. He was good company for an old man, a bright, cheerful, and attentive lad, filled with funny little stories mostly concerning his father's dealings through the years. He had inherited all of his father's sense of justice and fair play, along with his total mistrust of any civil authority or worldly power. He asked me a lot of questions about his father's and my adventure together in the Caribbean. He'd heard the story before, but he seemed to take a great pleasurable satisfaction in my accounting of the familiar story through different eyes. My father's right, you know, he said the last night he was here. It's a most unusual and exciting story of adventure that you have to offer. I hope you'll write it up as he's asked you to. I've read Captain Johnson's famous history of the pirates, and the story as he relates it seems sparse and dry. It leaves you wanting to know more of the people involved. I know that he left much of the detail out in order to protect you and some others, but the time is right now to set it down so that it's not lost. On that first day, I closed up my workshop and we went for a ramble north along the river. I could see that he was a skilled woodsman, he being quiet and watchful even as we walked for pleasure. At dusk, he called and bagged a fine fat turkey, which we roasted that night. He carried with him a wonderful rifle gun that he said had been brought up special for him from Lancaster in the Pennsylvania colony. The rifle was as long as he was tall. <clears throat> it had an octagon barrel with a fire seasoned tiger maple stock and browned steel lock and furnishings, a very businesslike piece. The workmanship was unadorned but very fine in all particulars, and it was marked with the gunsmith's etching on the top of the barrel by the lock. Jacob Shell, Maker, Mountjoy Township, Pennsylvania, 1751. He was also justly proud of the piece and later showed me some prodigious shooting. 
He easily hit the head sized knob on a beech tree 150 paces off. Three shots in a row and in right smart time as well. Although the process of loading a rifle gun is a slight more particular than ramming home a cartridge into a musket. We fished together the second day. We caught a half dozen of fat trout. We rolled them in corn flour and fried them with salt pork, crackling, and onions. We ate them with my cornbread and dandelion greens, and we washed them down with my dandelion wine. Life is good here on the river. I live in a garden. I was some affected to see him go, and I think he felt something like it as well, for he took his time in the preparation. I gave him a jug of maple syrup and a jug of my wine for the trip, and we embraced at parting. After he mounted, he turned his horse to face me and backed it away a few steps, showing himself to be a horseman, not just a man on a horse. He threw me a knuckle to his forehead, sailor fashion. That's from my father, he said. He hopes you'll come to Gloucester or else go to hell. <laughs> he chuckled, he said, uh, he says there might at least be no black flies in hell because he thinks old Ned wouldn't want the competition. He turned then and rode down the hill past the beech tree that he peppered. He turned and doffed his wide brimmed hat to me one last time before disappearing into the forest at the bend of the trail. I went back into my cabin and opened the little chest his father had sent. I took up the Spanish dagger and I sat there with it in my hands for some time. My thoughts drifting back through the years to the Caribbean and to her. Around noon, I heard someone calling for attention from my workshop. I thought about him throughout the remainder of the day, how different he was from the generation that his father and I came from. He was born in this land. He felt the full force of the freedom this new world has to offer to the bold and the restless as a birthright. There was no trace in him of the differential, deferential, and servile attitude that marked the first settlers, seeped as they were in the class structures and hereditary authorities of the old world. He was like some young Scythian warrior, resourceful and cunning, completely self-reliant, confident of his skills, and owning no man to be his better, most especially because of birth. I reflected that soon an entire race of young men like him would populate these colonies, and I wondered to myself how long a people like them would serve a king who was an ocean and more removed from them. I stopped work early and enjoyed a cigar on my porch overlooking the fields and the river. That night I dreamed of her again. The dreams come when they will. I do not dwell on the thoughts and thus invite them though I'll admit that recent events might have spawned this one. Rather, they seem to come to remind me, to twist my heart. In the beginning of the dream, it is so real to me that I think I have awakened from another dream to find her still with me. Later in the dream, I always lose sight of her somehow, and then the sad and fruitless searching begins again. I awake with a start, always deeply affected. Sometimes I will urge myself back to sleep trying to recapture the dream. It never works. The dreams are both a joy and a pain. In them I can walk along again beside her and feel her name on my lips. But in them I must lose her once more before I awaken. The next morning I walked for a while along the river and then sat down to begin this story. Captain Johnson's book. I have it here on a list of uh, primary sources and stuff uh, if anyone's interested. The General History of the Robberies and Murders of the Most Notorious Pirates uh, was written by Captain Charles Johnson. And it was published in London in 1724. There's been a couple of editions since then. Everything that is thought to be known of the subject of Mary Reed is contained in that book. Everything after that is commentary. The only other place where you can get what is actually known about her is that there's a book called The Pirate Trial of Anne Bonny and Mary Reed by Tamara Eastman and Constance Bond. It's basically a reprinting of the, uh, of the Admiralty Court records. That's a really good source. Again, everything revolves around Johnson's history. Everything after that is just commentary. Uh, I also went to the transcripts of the Vice Admiralty records directly from Q England. You know, 
I needed to know exactly what happened at the trial. And so there's a list here of the lure of ships, a lost country like Dorothy Hartley. You have to read Dorothy Hartley, anything at all that she wrote. Uh, scenes from a country life, two years before the mass, Caribbean. Anyone would like to, you know, copy out that, certainly welcome to it. I'll touch on a couple of things. Uh, piracy. <clears throat> piracy is a violent exercise in order to take money. It's deeper at sea. It's by nature violent. Uh, those who trade with them, the, the uh, smugglers, they're all guilty of piracy as well. And the Admiralty's authority goes all the way to the high water mark. Now, as you probably maybe know, uh, once a month or so there's a really high tide, higher than the normal tide. The Admiralty's authority extends any navigable water to that high tide mark. Any crime that's committed within that, those boundaries is the, is the business of, of the Admiralty courts. Okay. I'll entertain any question. Who was Anne? Who was Anne? The other one that was tried with her, Anne? Anne yeah, Bonnie. Anne Bonnie. Who was she? Uh, Anne Bonnie. For Anne Bonnie, it was a masquerade. Uh, she was a spoiled daughter of a, of a South Carolina lawyer. His story is told in here, by the way. The full, the full story is told. Uh, and she did it, what we would call for goof these days. Uh, she just felt like dressing up like a pirate. Uh, Mary Reed, however, had been brought up from childhood as a boy. That story also is told in here, but in essence, uh, her mother, her mother was, as she refers to her, sort of airy. Uh, she was married, pregnant. She gave birth to Mark Reed. The husband went to sea and like many men in those days, never returned. In the interim, uh, Mary Reed's mother had a, uh, an assignation with uh, a big, tall, blonde Scotsman. Uh, Mary says that she thinks the gin helped a little bit. And she was pregnant with Mary. Mark was sickly. But Mark was responsible for the family getting money from the grandmother. And when Mark died, Mary was put in his place. Now this is back, you know, a hundred mile trip in those days was a major occurrence. So that by the time uh, the grandmother actually saw Mary, she was convinced this was her grandson and she continued to, it wasn't much, but it was enough to keep them going. Uh, and Mary's mother basically advised her that, you know, your, your, your future as a, as a woman, particularly in, in your social milieu, is pretty grim. As a man, you can at least go in the army, go in the navy. You can now Mary Reed's story is unusual, but it's not unique. If you go on the web and look it up, you can find stories, particularly in the Civil War. There were four women during the American Civil War that served in the army. One of them, they didn't know that she was a woman until she died in a you know, in a pensioner's home 20 years after the war. Uh, so it's not something that never happened before, but she was brought up, as I said, from a child as a man. Her story, she joined the Navy, where well, she joined the merchants. Uh, she jumped ship, uh, joined the Army, marched with Marlborough, as it said here. She was commended for bravery on two occasions. Uh, she was actually given uh, a little gorget, she was a candidate for officerhood. But in those days, the only way you got to be an officer was this way. Uh, the guilt. Pay so much money, you can get the commission when it becomes available. She had no money, so she never got a commission. She decided that it was better to ride than to walk, so she transferred to the cavalry. In the cavalry, she met a young man, fell in love, they got married. Uh, if you read the Captain Johnson's third edition, you'll get more detail about that. But again, this is all like, it's all there, 
but there's nothing else that substantiates it really. All right. uh, <coughs> they bought a little inn outside of Breda in the Netherlands. Uh, as the story goes, the husband died, uh, the inn failed, Mary went back to the army, garrison life was boring, she signed on to a merchant vessel, the merchant vessel was taken by Jack Rapper. She signed on with the pirates, and why she did it, that'll come up in the story here as well. Uh, all right, so the Rachel, chapter one will tell you all you need to know about, uh, about our friend, uh, Mr. Tanner. It uh, carries it through all the way, carries the story all the way through to the point where they first become aware that they're being tracked by a pirate missile. They're taken by Rackham. Uh, there is some brutalization. So I thought that I'd uh, head over to what happens here. There's a, there's a courtroom that they've set up on board the, uh, the Kestrel. They try the captain of, uh, of the ship that they took, the vessel that they took. Uh, he's found not guilty, so they don't hang him. They love the pirates at this, at least at this point. They, they love to mock the regular world. They were not anarchistic. And I'll get into the rules. They had their own rules. They, they set up their own articles for sale. Every man was expected to sign on to the articles. Every man was expected to live up to the articles. Uh, if you didn't, it was not a good thing. <laughs> Uh, so here we are, I'm going I'm to do uh, Rackham's little speech here for you, because this is the one that, that Mary Reed fell for. Uh, it's my own version of this kind of speech, but it's based upon speeches that I read of other pirates that were, recruit, that were recruiting. And I found it very interesting, I, I found a list uh, at the Greenfield Public Library in one of their history books. A list of the vessels that were taken in the Caribbean Sea during 1718 or so. And I discovered by reading that, that in some cases the entire crew of a merchant vessel would sign on with the pirates, but on average, 30% of the crew went over to the pirates. Why? Because it was a way to maybe be more than what they were. And it's the only way that was really open to them. It's after a period of 50 or 60 years of warfare in Europe. Uh, these are, most of them are men that were taken by the press gangs from the streets, impressed into the services, trained to be warriors, and when the war ends, they have no skills except those skills they learned on board a man of war. And so they naturally tended to, tr to look for a situation, as Mary did, where they could make money and come out of the situation. Mary wants to make money so that she can remove herself and be independent. And that comes out in the book and there's several points in here where Mary's dream, what she wants to do, you know, it's her story. So anyway, let's, let's go back to Jack Rackham. Jack Rackham, if you look him up in the books, he was a moderately successful, yeah, sort of pirate. Uh, he had run with some of the best, uh, he had served with Charles Bain, uh, and uh, Edward English, I believe. Uh, and, but by the time this book comes to this, this time, he, you know, had become more of a pretty minor player as far as pirates are concerned. But, but he had to be major to me, so what I did was I incorporated Roberts, the great Black Bart Roberts, into Rackham. Roberts is somebody that's worth you ever saw the movie uh, Princess Bride? They always talk about the, the dread pirate Roberts. There really was such a guy. You know? <laughs> His story is interesting in itself. I mean, there's just a million interesting stories. <laughs> well, so, okay, now we're all done. The ship's been, the vessel's been taken. The crew's been terrorized. Uh, they've shifted all the cargo over to uh, the Kestrel, the, the pirate vessel. And now it's coming time for them to leave. So Rackham comes up as the first aurora of dawn came up from the eastern horizon. The last of the spoil was thrown across to the pirate vessel. The one called Magoon, oh you'll love Magoon. 
He's based on my father. <laughs> <laughs> then strode over to our bitnickel. Now, bitnickel is just a, an antiquated word for, for the binnacle. But you remember, uh, this is a lot happened between 1720 and 1750 or 60 as far as terminology. Larboard became port, for instance, the bitnickel. That's, it was just a corruption of the word binnacle. Uh, all right, stepped uh, behind the binnacle and two great blows of his boarding axe smashed it to pieces. This is on the captured vessel. We would have no compass to guide us now, as well as having no food nor water and several days of frantic work to get steerage on our drifting vessel because the pirates had cut all the running lines called the sheets. The sheet is not the sail, the sheet is the rope. So when they say, guys, three sheets to the wind, picture it. Sails flapping and the ropes are flapping. Uh, Reed and the pirate captain came up from the hole onto the quarter deck. They stood well aft by the taff rail, back rail, and shared some quiet discussion with the little bug eyed judge. That would be Trinket. You'll run into him. He became a major character in this. Uh, Rackham spoke briefly and then with some warming, I thought, to our office, to their officers, meaning the from the vessel that was taken, basically telling them, you sit there and you shut up, or I'll stick you with a blade and throw you over the side. Pretty simple. These people did not, as the kids say, mess around. It wasn't, it was a very clear threat. It was up to you if you wanted to be tossed over the side or not. Everything's Democrat. <laughs> As the bulk of the pirate crew jumped and leaped and swung across to their own deck amid wild shouts and laughter, Rackham stepped forward to the edge of the quarter deck and addressed our assemblage crew in the friendliest of terms. Lads, he began, you've had a trying time, I know, but our visit together is about to come to an end. It's our custom at these times of parting to offer the freedom of our company to any of you who have a heart to join us in freedom and equality. He drew the Scots sword and he plunged its point into the deck and laid one hand atop the other upon its basket hilt and leaned forward upon the weapon. He looked before him into the, onto the deck for a moment, gathering himself it seemed. Then he lifted his gaze and slowly swept the assembled crew of the merchantman with the most penetrating and commanding look imaginable. We sail as a commonwealth of free men, he began. We are all bound together in a solemn partnership, all for the benefit of each, and each bound to the benefit of all. As a free commonwealth of equals, we bear allegiance to no flag nor sovereign except that of ourselves. In so doing, we have as much right as any people on earth. For every people, every tribe, and nation of men exists only by the exercise of its own will to do so. In the world we've together spurned, all of these tribes and peoples and nations have without exception fallen in thraldom to the will of the strongest, the cruelest, or the richest among them. These then have bullied and fancied themselves into kings and princes and dukes and barons, and they took to themselves the power to pass lands and riches and rights and power to their drooling piss-pot whelps. By so doing, they perpetuate their riches upon riches upon riches to their heirs till there be no more riches for others, and the lash must be used upon their enslaved brothers. Damn their eyes! <laughs> now, lads, this is all done to the purpose of enforcing their will upon their fellows. Men like yourselves, men who are their equals in all but entitlement of birth or sovereign riches, he looked skyward with great drama and in a loud voice quoted an old, old verse. The Lord who from the earth made churls, from that same earth made he the earls. I got that right out of uh, directly the book I was talking about, The Lost Country Life. Uh, it's one of several poems I lifted out of that. Uh, Rackham returned his attention to our crew and said in a soft voice, the worm knows not, brothers, on rich and poor alike he dines. Now friends, the riches themselves have no thought, and they care not whose purse they rest in. 
Riches may be taken by the bold, and richness, riches with boldness make for strength, and strength in the end is liberty. Now, brothers, where do all these riches that the cruel fops of privilege wallow in come from? You may well ask it, brothers. The riches come from the sweat of those who are held in bondage to them by armed force or by the foolish habits of a servile mind. The riches come in the end from you yourselves, brothers. They come from your toil and sweat, from your father's toil and sweat, and from his father's toil and sweat. They have been stolen, in fact, from all of those who starve and freeze and groan and sweat to wrest a little comfort from an unfeeling world. Riches, my friend, are always stolen, and they care not by whom. He paced to the windward rail, looked out to see, then turned to speak again. Today you've seen those hirelings set over you, brought to trial on this deck by we who today hold the power to do so. I warrant, and some of you will know it firsthand to be true, that they were given a hearing far more fair this day than any of you would have had in any court in the world. We judged them solely on their treatment of you, who are their servants. And it was you alone who saved them from the stern hand of justice by a dependable witness that they had done you no ill. Yet, friends, there is still an ill to come, for you will sail again and sweat again to make another's ease or you will plow or gather or grind for another master who will hold your body and life. And will that master be his kind? He'd worked himself up to a fine passion through the course of his speech, and now he pulled his sword out of the deck and held it across his hands. From the frail of the pirate vessel, there was a loud murmuring of approval and a shout of encouragement from the rogues gathered there to watch their commander bring their great play to its climax. Here is the cutter of ropes and whips and chains, my brothers, he sang out, and flashed the bright blade over his head. Who among you will join our company in the Brotherhood of the Coast, and with one act of his will, free himself from the shackles of a world that despises him? A world where you may be starved or beaten or flogged or hanged at the will of men who value only the profit that your bowels may bring them. A world where you may be cast into deadly combat with others of your class, all for the glory of some rag on a stick, or for the advancement of some sweating prig in a cassock or an ermine. We here are all humble men as ye, born to fight and sweat and groan and die. Join our company and do all these same things, but for your own and not for another's gain. Come up now, brothers, and step forward. The hour is late, and we sail hence at war against all flags. That's how you recruit people to be a pirate. <laughs> Harry Reid stepped up. I, I took a third of the crew and had them step up here, including two young men you will read about in the end. Any questions? Anything? Why was she a pirate? How long was she a pirate? How long was Mary Reid a pirate? Not that long. The best I can uh, venture on that is maybe about three years in total. Something like that. And how old was she when she died? From what I can tell, uh, 34, 35, wow. there's a difference between her and, and Tanner. Tanner's a young man to her. Tanner is maybe six years, seven years younger. I wanted to get that older woman, younger man, transvestite, you know, a bunch of stuff. It's the Pioneer Valley, I'm trying to get it all. <laughs> Salma Gundy. All right, here's where we get into the organization of the vessel. You're probably uh, used to thinking in terms of the captain of the vessel being absolutely next to God. And in terms of the Navy, and in terms of the merchant Navy at that time, that was pretty much the case. Pirate captain is different. Uh, now, the scenario that I'm painting in this book uh, is not unusual, but it's also not the only. Uh, if you take a man like uh, Tish, if you take a man like Blackbeard, Blackbeard ruled his crew, his crew with basically terror of his uh, temper. Uh, he was absolutely in charge. He had about him what they would call, call in the book here, a uh, uh, House of Lords. These are the guys who were really, really loyal to him. Didn't have to be everybody, only needed to be maybe 10, 20% of the crew, but these were men that were 
walk to him. Teach, for instance, was infamous for uh, have a big crew of men, they take a big uh, hit, and then he'd pull off and uh, go to get water, and he'd send half of his crew ashore to get water, and the minute they got ashore, he'd simply sail away. So now every, every share is worth twice what it was. Rackham talks about that, uh, about Tish. Uh, Bartholomew Roberts, the dread pirate Roberts, same thing, he really ran his ship. The way he ran a pirate ship, was by success, period. All these care guys care about is the brass. If you're supplying the brass and they see that every time you take a vessel they make money, they're not gonna argue with you. Okay, whatever you want to do, Chief. But in reality, these officers were all elected, freely elected, uh, and they could be recalled on the spot. Uh, Charles Vane, for instance, uh, he was recalled because they, his crew accused him of cowardice because he refused to, to close with a particular vessel. He felt that the vessel was a man of war. The crew felt that it wasn't. And he decided not to. They removed him as captain and actually put his quartermaster, who was our friend Jack Rackham, in command of that particular pirate vessel at that time. All right. Now, I stopped to take a drink and freshen my face at one of the several scuttlebutts said about the vessel. A man of war or a merchantman would have had only one, and that out where the officers could observe its usage. You know the word scuttlebutt, right? It comes from a scuttled butt. Scuttled means that there's a hole punched in the butt. It's the butt of water. A hole's punched in it, and now you can get it to water. Uh, on board merchantmen and naval vessels, uh, they kept very tight control over that. Board a pirate ship, not so much. So they had a couple of scuttled butts out. You can look at it as the, uh, the water cooler on board a ship. Uh, what's the scuttle butt? You know, what are they talking about at the water cooler? Uh, the between deck of the vessel was the worst of the frolic the night before. They just had a big party because of the, the taking of the vessel. But I could still see much. While there seemed to be a general orderliness about the craft, a business-like sort of order, there was no doubt, however, that the crew did little in the way of sailors' drudge work. This impression was supported by the condition of the main deck as I came up. Any captain I knew would have had all hands on holy stones and swabs for the week. Holy stones. I actually used one when I was in reform school. We used to scrub the floors. A holy stone was a, basically a brick. You scrub the deck with it. So if you holy stone somebody, it means you give them a bath. Uh, you run into that in here as well, and, and swallows. My first surprise as I came to the waist was that Rackham sat upon a chest by the starboard rail. He was not the center of the coming activities. Bonnie, Reed, and two others sat about him. It was the quartermaster corner who commanded the proceedings. It's another of the peculiarities of the freebooters that the captain of a pirate vessel has nothing of the power of that title as the rest of the maritime world understands it. He is more properly called simply commander. He is the elected official of a partnership and is answerable to it. He leads by success alone and receives a double share of the common, the purse. Uh, his command during times of pursuit or combat is absolute. And at those times he may strike, cut or shoot without censure any man who disobeys his orders or shirks at his duties. At all other times, he is a respected senior voice in the meetings of the partnership, but no more. Any influence he gains beyond that is gained by sheer force of character and above all, and trumping any other consideration, success. The business of sailing the vessel is under the direct command of the sailing master. Uh, all hands are expected to follow his orders in this regard and to take their turn to come on watch as he directs. He has all the officers as elected, however, his is a position requiring the most specific knowledge. An incompetent master uh, is quickly apparent, and thus the position is most critical to the actions of the pirates. Any man may be lucky or bold, but not every man may be a master mariner. Uh, Featherston was all of that. All matters as to the account and the management of the partner's interests came under the direction of the quartermaster. Now, normally a quartermaster on a deck at this time was, 
exactly that. He's the master of the quarter deck. So he was the one standing by the, by the wheel. He was in charge there, the quartermaster. Uh, the quartermaster here is accounted second to the commander. When the vessel is in action, it will take command if the former should fall. As his title may imply, he serves as the master of the quarter deck. On a naval vessel, this would be a warrant officer's position under the watch lieutenant. Here he represents the commonwealth that in fact commands the vessel. These two, the master and the quartermaster, each receive a share and a half of the common. It is in this wise that the quartermaster of the Kestrel who officiated at the addition of men to the crew and who would read the articles under which they sailed and under which they would live. Gather up now. Lads, pay attention. Corner cried out. Gather up now, lads. <laughs> pay attention. <laughs> That's what he did. Hmm. Any questions? How long, how long did it take you to write this? I'm sorry, ma'am? How long did it take you to write this? Well, considering that I started the novel when Cabarrus of the Caribbean came out, I guess you could oh, right. about 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I, I was about halfway through it, not quite halfway through it, uh, when uh, Will read it and, as I said, he threatened and hurt me. <laughs> so one, once, I, once I sat down to actually finish it, it was six months to, to finish it. I've gone, from, well actually I only had eight chapters in place. Uh, I, I had already uh, excised a bunch of chapters. I was so interested in it, it started to turn into a, like, a, like a travel log. You know, like this is beautiful Jamaica. Uh, and I realized I was just, I was getting boring. And I needed to get to it and get to the action of it too. Because there is action in here, there is, a, there is a bloody, brutal fight, a bloody, brutal duel, uh, and a couple of gun battles at sea as well. In your romance. Now let me go ahead. Uh, w. Zor once more upon the deck, he began to read aloud. Well, we're getting to that point, aren't we? Yeah, we are. <laughs> Let me just run through the, the articles a little bit quickly for you. Uh, I began to read the articles of the Commonwealth from a large portfolio set aside by, by the Bitnagel, held in place by two pistols. Uh, the first two articles provided for the free election as well as the duties, authorities, and responsibilities of the officers. Uh, these officers being duly elected, recall as a replacement, blah, blah, blah. Each man who signed the articles under which we sailed was the equal of any other man. Each had an equal vote in all of the affairs of the Commonwealth. Each man had a claim on an equal share of the common holdings of the company, except, as I've mentioned before, the premiums that were allotted to the officers. Uh, each man was there sworn to obey the necessary directions of the officers elected over them and to uphold their civil authority in the management of the common affairs. No gambling was allowed among them. No fights or disorders were allowed, to, allowed among them. I'm going to move on to Will wants to uh, start wrapping up a little bit here. Because what I want to do is I want to uh, get to that. I can't read it. I want to get to that point. Uh, that was fascinating. You said, like, you know, what's that? I want to get to that point where Reed begins to open up to Tanner. Because we haven't really talked about Reed yet. Uh, but now, you know, in the course of the story, you get to know Reed. You get to know Reed through Tanner's eyes. But this is the first point in the story where he begins to open up to Tanner and, and give Tanner a little glimpse into Mark Reed or Mary Reed. Uh, they, meet, uh, they meet up after one of the, the hoorahs. And uh, Reed, uh, or rather, uh, Tanner says to Reed that you look in pretty good shape for the party that was on last night. And Reed returns, God has blessed me with no taste or stomach for rum. It gets me all befuddled and giddy early on and then surly and short-tempered later. And then I sleep hard and I wake up most unpleasant. No, for my part, I stay with good ale or stout if need be. And I preserve myself sober and with my wits about me for the business at hand. That phrase would be used a number of times in the, in the novel. What business is that, then, Mr. Reed? He smiled at me. 
only I could see the warmth of it. His face was so changeable. It was as if two, face, two faces shared the same features. One face was not unpleasant, indeed most handsome, but very firm and resolute of cast, and the other face different in a way that eluded me. <laughs> you have no need ever to call me mister. Just call me Reed as my friends and my comrades do. I wish us to be friends and comrades. His gaze was full into mine and most friendly. The business at hand, John, is the closing of the account as quickly as possible. It's no secret to any aboard that I wish to make this venture my last and take my brass somewhere away from the sea, somewhere where there are green hills and rivers full of fat trout that belong to them as can catch them, and meadows somewhere that I may sit upon my porch of an evening and smoke cigarros. He laughed at his own picture, and his laughter took the character lines out of his face, and for an instant, he showed a very young face, very fair to see. When I were a child, he continued, we lived in the country for a time. His eyes drifted away to some place only he could see. It was by a little river, and there was a man once who gave me two small trout, just so as would fit in my pockets. He begged me to take them home to Mama, to tell no one of them. I remember my mother was very affected by them. We ate them that night, that very night. They were so sweet and good. I asked if there were more. My mother cried, I remember. His eyes returned to mine. They were soft at first, but then they seemed to turn to flint. Then I came to know that my friend was called a poacher and that he had risked a great deal to give a poor child a treat and that all the trout belonged to the Lord who owned the waters and all that swam in them, and that they were not for such as we, but for his pleasure at his table only. After a pause, he finally said, yes, I want to live where the water is shallow and clear and fresh and cold, and where I may smoke cigars, and where I may eat trout any time I like. <coughs> I set out to write a serious book about a serious subject, about a great love story to me. Uh, the woman put her life on the line for the man that she loved. It's hard to argue with somebody who puts their money where their mouth is. Uh, it ends tragically, as great love stories should, really. I mean, in Ulysses, it's the dog that dies, but there's still the point of death in the, in the, in the Odyssey. And this is an odyssey as well. It's a, it's a journey. It's a love story and a journey. Uh, it's the best that I can do, and I hope you like it. And if you do, I